A quick show of hands. How many of you have ever been invited to sit on a committee, perhaps at work or at school, or even in your place of worship, where you meet for week after week, month after month, or heaven forbid, year after year, and after all that talking, maybe even ranting and raving, in the end, nothing ever changes. Yeah, me too. Welcome to the human race. Of course, we know this doesn't happen just professionally. I'm betting that it won't take you even a moment to think of somebody in your personal life where you have the same kind of difficulties. Perhaps it's your spouse or partner, one of your children, maybe even your mother-in-law. I'd like to talk to you today about the ways we get stuck in this communication quickstand and how we can get to the heart of what isn't being said to transform our relationships into the places that we want to live and be. In a deeply scientific research study of my Facebook friends, <laughs> we looked at leaders around the globe who were not only excellent communicators, but were able to listen to unconventional people in unexpected ways to transform the worlds in which they lived. These people listened to the voices of the oppressed, to citizens dreaming a new world. They listened to women. They listened to children. <laughs> they listened to the invisible, untouchable people who have disease. And many of these communicators had the gift that Bill Clinton has, that when you speak to them, it's as if you were the only person in the room and yours was the only story that mattered. We know, however, that it's not just people who are global leaders that are excellent listeners. These are the people who rise to their top of their professions no matter what they do. They can be doctors listening to their patients, they can be architects helping a family build their dream home. They can be CEOs who are listening to clients. They can be community violence interventionists listening to gang members. And they can be teachers and parents who listen every day to their children and their teenagers. When we think about communication, this is the paradigm I think that most of us operate under. We think that most of communication is about this verbal stuff that comes spewing forth from our mouths. It's the talking piece, and that's about 90% of communication. And we recognize, of course, that there is nonverbal communication at play as well. And we know this when we see somebody cross their arms or frown at us across a table, turn away and be busy with their iPhones, and of course, we're all very well in tune with the eye roll. <laughs> and we realize that these nonverbals are probably a good cue to what's happening with an emotional state. And that when we express our emotions, we realize we're getting to some material that's quite important. And of course, with this expressed emotion, we realize that we're having an internal emotional response. And at some level, we realize that we're bringing ourselves to the table, okay? Who we are. But mostly, we disregard this. What I think communication really is, however, is this. That, in fact, the core of who we are is the bulk of communication. The core, of course, is the sum of all the things that we've ever learned, either in our families, what we were taught in school, or perhaps even in our places of worship. This is the sum of our values, attitudes, and beliefs. They're the stories we tell about ourselves, about each other, and about the way the world works. To illustrate this point, I'd like to tell you the story of a man and a boy clasping hands. And when I tell you this story, perhaps this is an image that comes to mind. 
a father and his son on the beach having a tender moment together. And perhaps when you look at this picture, you see the relationship that you had with your own father, and it brings up within you feelings of nostalgia for a more loving and carefree time. Or perhaps you look at this picture with resentment, because your relationship with your father doesn't look at all like this. It's one full of conflict and misunderstanding. Or perhaps you look at this picture with longing, because you don't have a father at all. In a more global way, we can talk about a man and a boy clasping hands this way. And in this particular scenario, who we are has a lot to say about how we feel about this particular picture. If you're the young boy soldier in this picture, this may have been the proudest day of your military career, when a high-ranking government official came and singled you out to shake your hand. If, however, your family was one of the families sent to Bergen-Belsen, Dachau, or Auschwitz, you're going to look at this picture, perhaps with feelings of rage and intense grease, grief and loss about the atrocities that happened as a result of this particular action. Or, if you're like me, of German heritage, I can only look at this picture with a deep sense of abiding shame. Even though, to the best of my knowledge, no one in my family was engaged in this kind of activity, I recognize that my country of origin, this was one of their deepest and darkest moments in history. We realize, of course, that the sum of who we are has a tremendous impact on how we look at those pictures and that the core of ourselves, our values, attitudes, beliefs, and stories that we tell ourselves have a lot to do with how we feel and respond when these things come up. What's interesting about our core self is that it is constantly in development from the time we are born until we draw our last breath. And equally interesting is that we realize that the stories that we told ourselves at age four may not work so well at age 54, that some of those stories are functional and some of them are non-functional. But most surprisingly of all, I am amazed that with very few exceptions, this best and most meaningful part of ourself is the one we spend the least time attending to when we're in dialogue with somebody else. That perhaps with the exception of the most communicative partnerships and marriages between deep and abiding lifelong friends, or perhaps in the work of therapy, our core self almost never enters into the conversation at all. Now, there's some very good reasons for why this occurs, and that's because emotion often enters into the picture. And with emotion, comes, for most of us, this sense of raw, unfettered power, and that can feel dangerous. This is a normal human brain, and when we see pictures like we saw before or hear stories, this part of our brain gets activated. And this part of my, our brains is what I affectionately call the dinosaur brain. Okay? It is the oldest part of our brain, and it is the part that is instinctive, primitive, and nonverbal. Okay? And in this part of our brain live three characters. There lives T-Rex, and this is the part of us that will defend, perhaps even to the death, the things that are most important to us, our families, our values, our beliefs. There also lives Chicken Little. The sky is falling, the sky is falling. This is when we want to run away from perceived threat. And we have a deer in the headlights. And this is when we don't know what to do and we just do this. Okay? Fortunately, for most of us, we are grateful that our brains keep developing well into our mid-20s.
In this part of our brain, the prefrontal cortex is what I affectionately call the boss brain. And this is the verbal thinking part of our brain. This is the part of our brain that allows us to think long term, that allows us to weigh out pros and cons. It allows us to take perspective and have empathy. And at the head of this part of our brain lives another character, and we hope it's somebody like this. Okay? We want the best and smartest parts of ourselves to live here. And so while we are grateful for these three instincts, Chicken Little, T-Rex, Deer in the Headlights, Fight, Flight, and Freeze, where most skilled listeners live, I think, is here in the prefrontal cortex where Albert Einstein hopefully lives. In my very first job out of graduate school, I was part of a national research study where quarter after quarter, year after year, we met to discuss, to discuss and debate the most salient parts of the project. What evaluation measures we were going to be using, what clinical interventions we were going to be giving to clients, what outcomes we wanted. And as part of this study, at every level of the discretion and the decision making, were former clients, women who had histories of trauma, simultaneous with substance abuse addiction, and mental illness. And these women had lots to say about what we were doing. And there were times in our discussion that things looked a little bit like this. And when this happened, my T-Rex and Chicken Little and Deer in the Headlights got activated. I told myself stories about people who behave this way. Because when they were this angry in public, this was different than how things are solved in my tribe. In my tribe, when there's conflict, we take that off screen to a private room. We handle it very quietly without raising our voices. Or we pretend it doesn't exist at all. So I was very unused to this vehement sort of energy and some of the unpretty ways in which information was being shared. And the stories I told myself about these women were that they were unprofessional and had bad manners. At the end of five years, one of the women who were the most vocal in this particular uh, study shared this story. She said, we know that it's been hard for you to hear us talk and be angry and say things that may even have been hurtful. But I want you to know that where I come from, Problems don't get solved until somebody leaves in an ambulance. And I realized something very important. I realized that her experience and my experience was not a matter of right or wrong. It was just different. And that I wasn't actually being threatened. That in fact what she was trying to do was convey some very important information to me about something that I was missing and that if I could get behind the expression of anger to understand her feelings of fear, of loss, of feeling unseen or misunderstood, that's where we could start solving some real problems. We know, of course, that relationships happen in context over time and the development of trust. And we realize that there are key important influences to that dialogue. That understanding culture has a tremendous impact on how well we communicate with each other. That awareness of ethnic differences have an impact. That gender roles play a perspective. That religious values make a difference. And of course, we're always aware of the dynamics of power. So how do we do things differently? Skilled listeners do things that I think we can all learn to become better at, and they are these. First and foremost, skilled listeners are, managed, are able to manage their own emotions. 
When their T-Rex, Chicken Little, Deer in the Headlights gets activated, they're able to move to the prefrontal cortex part of their brain, take perspective and have empathy for somebody else living in a different experience. They realize that emotion is just information and that if we can get to the details behind the expressed emotion, we have a chance of really understanding what is going on for people. We realize that we need to seek out critical information. We need to go into the places where we are afraid to ask questions. We need to be willing to ask, to learn, and to be wrong. We realize that in a healthy relationship, anything can be talked about, even the most painful, challenging, and difficult parts of ourselves. If we speak the truth, the world is not going to fall apart. And we need to check our stories. What are we telling ourselves about who we are, about who you are, and about the way the world works? Is this a helpful way to help us move forward, or are we stuck? In one of his books, Robertson Davies tells a story about two men engaged in conversation, one who is Indian, one who is Caucasian. And the Indian man says, inside of me live two dogs, and one of them is an incredibly friendly dog. It meets the world with enthusiasm and exuberance where every stranger is a potential friend. But there also lives inside of me another dog, and this dog looks at the world with suspicion with mistrust, everything is dangerous, and it has a real potential to be aggressive. And the Caucasian man says, two dogs that live inside of you? And the Indian man says, yes, and they're always at war. And the Caucasian man says, well, then which one wins? And the Indian man says, it's the dog I feed the most. I'd invite you now to think of the one person or group of people with whom you have had the most conflict. This is a relationship where you're the most likely to have experienced pain and misunderstanding and feeling like you are stuck. And I'm going to ask you to think about the places where you get emotionally hijacked in that conversation. And I'm going to ask you to think about ways that you could get behind the emotion to ask the more meaningful questions. Because that, I think, is where we can move from where we are stuck to getting to the heart of what really matters. That the stories we tell about ourselves and about each other and about whether or not we can make this different is critical. We all know that there's no magic wand to making the world a better place. However, I firmly believe that if we listen deeply, thoroughly, to the heart of what matters, that this is an excellent place to begin. Thank you. <laughs>